Hello, everybody. This week provides us with, I think, a perfect opportunity to go over a rare yet very important piece of information, which was established in the manga some time ago. And yet I see this fact being forgotten in a lot of online discussions most of the time. Now, this canon piece of information that I will be sharing with you is going to be particularly helpful to people that engage in power discussions. But even if you don't engage in power scaling, I think that the information is important and relevant enough that any One Piece fan should know about and should register it because it's pretty clear that it's going to play a role in an upcoming development. Development. Needless to say, this whole thing has to do with what we learn about in this newest chapter. So here we go. The heartbreaking cover featuring the three scientific antagonists appears to be taking place in Punk Hazard. And the reason why I describe it as heartbreaking is because it appears that the main purpose of MADS, or at least the initial purpose of MADS, was to get some scientists together to bring about world peace to create a better world, but just like in real life, it appears that somewhere down the line, the purpose got corrupted and twisted. And so we end up getting these three dudes developing weapons to suit their own selfish and personal agendas. Now, the fact that we see Judge's spear and we know that it could produce electricity, I think could mean that this cover story could be potentially connected to the NL cover story with the space pirates. We see that Caesar has now eaten the gas gas fruit at this point because you see the gas ribbon floating around his back, which was not present in the previous cover page where we last saw him. And then he also appears to be holding a precursor or one of the very first prototypes of what eventually will turn out to be the smileys. I'm guessing that the majority of people think that Stussy's double fruit power is just sort of like the standard mythical type Zoan model vampire, maybe model Dracula. But what if she turns out to be like a chupacabras? She also reminds me of Robin's Demonio Flor, so she might turn out to be a devil. I really liked the placing of Vegapunk's journal entry at the beginning of the chapter because it ties into the end. I'm assuming that the journal entry is referring to Stussy as well. Then again, it might be referring to somebody else. I don't know why I thought that maybe it was referring to Bonnie at the beginning. But yeah, no, I think it's very clearly Stussy. A new question that I do have here, though, given what's revealed at the end of the chapter is, you know the previous uh, cover story page where we saw the members of Mads standing up? There was a woman there that had her back towards the reader. And so my question is, is that woman supposed to be Stussy or is that supposed to be the original Miss Buckingham? Like, is that Miss Bawkins or is that the clone? Now, Oda has decided that it's finally time to expand on father and daughter's devil fruit powers at the same time. And so with Bonnie, the exposition is a little bit more visual. And so one of the things that I thought was interesting is that when she does her future buff, her upper body is literally the upper body of her father. Like, she literally just gains Kuma's upper body, in a sense. So it seems like she's playing around with her own genetics, right? Or she's manipulating her own genes to give herself that upper body strength. Another thing that I thought was sort of a little cool Easter egg is that she produces jewels when she pokes Vegapunk, and that those jewels represent the years that he's lost. And so her producing jewels with her double fruit power, I thought was very appropriate, given that her name is Jewelry Bonnie. So it's in the name. It also reminds me of what Diamond Josie did at Marineford where he lifts up a massive chunk of ice in the shape of a diamond. And so Bonnie turns Vegapunk into a kid. And what's kind of funny is that if she were to do this to a regular person, you know, the baby or the toddler would just sort of cry. Like, I, I doubt that they would be able to speak. But because she does it to Vegapunk, who's a genius, he's still able to speak like a regular adult. This chapter also confirms something that I had already talked about, which is that Bonnie's devil fruit power also works on objects. And the reason why this was easy to predict is because in the One Piece movie Stampede, she actually ages up some eggs and hatches them into birds. So if we consider eggs to be objects, it makes sense why she's able to rust the lock. Something that I also mentioned more than a year ago regarding Bonnie's fruit, which I still think holds true, is that we know about superior devil fruits, right? We know that there are some devil fruits that are superior versions of others. And so something that I concluded was that Bonnie's devil fruit has to be the superior version of Shinobu's ripe, ripe fruit. Because Shinobu's power can only make things age, right? She can only make things older. And just like Shinobu's power affecting objects, we now know that Bonnie can do the same thing. Plus she could also use her power on other people and herself to make them either younger or older. So Bonnie's double fruit comes with more flexibility. Now, depending on how you look at it, 
there is sort of a limitation that gets introduced in this chapter in regards to Bonnie's ability, which is that her powers don't last forever on living things. She specifically says on living things. So I don't know if this means that does it last forever on objects, on non-living things? But regardless, you know, it, it really does come down to whether you think the flexibility is a weakness or, or an actual asset. Now, the experiment referenced by Vegapunk about the weight of the soul is actually a reference to the real-life 21 grams experiment, which was conducted in 1907 by a doctor called Duncan MacDougall in Massachusetts. So basically what he did is that he weighed six of his patients that were about to pass away. So he weighed them before and after death, and he noticed a difference in the weight of the patients after they died. And so he concluded that the weight that they lost, which was an average of 21 grams, was actually the weight of the soul leaving the body. Now, despite the real world scientific community rejecting the validity of MacDougall's experiment in the world of One Piece, we already know that souls do in fact exist. Just ask Brooke or Big Mom. So maybe that's why Oda decided to keep Brooke on the ship this time around, because if he were to meet Vegapunk, like he would be living proof of the existence of the soul in One Piece. Now, Vegapunk says that the person who discovered the weight of the soul came from the West Blue. So it got me wondering whether Hogback had anything to do with that, because Hogback was recognized as a genius within the medical community, even by Chopper at one point. But most importantly, we know that his research was sort of focused on pushing the boundary of human knowledge and that he was heavily invested in trying to find ways to bring people back from the dead. Plus, he's actually from the West Blue. So you take a look at this kid and let me know if you think it's a stretch to believe that maybe he was somehow connected to the experiment that discovered the weight of the soul. And speaking of that, as we learned in Thriller Bark, Hogback has a very specific way of stitching people up, including the stitching that he's done on his face. The work really reminds me of the stitches that we've seen on Edward Weevil, but I'll be talking about that connection a little bit later in the video. I'm going somewhere with this, I promise. Meanwhile, we find that Kuma is trying to get to the top of the red line, but the question still remains as to why. Is it because the red line is blocking his passage into the new world and he needs to get to the other side or at least to the top to be able to enter the new world with his devil fruit power? Or is he actually trying to climb up to get to Marajoa and do something there? Another question that needs to be addressed is why does Kuma have bare ears on the top of his head during the Vegapunk flashback? Because unless it's some kind of like hairstyle or fashion statement, that can be removed, his bare ears being attached to the top of his head like that doesn't really line up with what we've seen of him in the past. So here's a picture of young Kuma with no bare ears on his head. And here's another picture of Kuma playing with Bonnie at one point. And again, he has no bare ears attached to the top of his head. So I just figured that his bare ears were actually just a part of his hat. I mean, unless he's part of a special race that grows bare ears on the top of their heads at a certain point during adulthood, then I guess that would make sense. Now, Vegapunk says that Kuma's power has the ability of making the intangible tangible. And so after the intangible takes physical form, he can actually transfer that to other people. And this is what we saw back in Thriller Bark, where he actually transferred some of Luffy's pain into Zoro's chest. And so something that I hadn't thought about till now was what would happen if Kuma were to remove or extract Usopp's fear? I think that would be kind of a cool scenario to play around with for a moment. Take away Usopp's fear and then see what happens. Not permanently though, because that wouldn't be fair for the story or for Usopp's character arc, because he wouldn't need to face challenges, right? But just momentarily have him without the fear and then see what he does. Vegapunk goes on and says that he's primarily interested in seeing whether or not memories and imagination could also be tangibilized. And so there's two very obvious reasons for why Vegapunk would be interested in these two things. But the first image that came to mind when he said that was the image of Luffy going gear fifth and then making a tangible object, in this case, some goggles from his imagination. Anyway, the first reason for why Vegapunk is so interested in the transmission of nerve signals is because of his dream. He has the dream of being able to one day make his brain into a giant global library that holds a sea of knowledge that the rest of the world can gain access to and can frequently update, right? So he's saying that Kuma's power could help with the sharing of information via wireless transmission so that he can share his knowledge and memories with the rest of the world, which is why the government currently wants Vegapunk dead. But then also memories and imagination are ingredients that go into creating devil fruits because devil fruits come from people's desires to evolve 
to imagine the next step in human evolution. And then we also know that memories are part of Zoan devil fruits as well. In chapter 1065, Pythagoras says that bloodline elements, DNA, actually records individual experiences. And so this is relevant because Kaido's bloodline elements were the thing that allowed Vegapunk to make Momonosuke's double fruit. In chapter 1061, there was a mecha shark that wasn't following orders because it was being overcome by the natural instincts, the animalistic memory of being a shark. We see the same thing happen with Sulong forms. Jinbei says that the transformation is actually the awakening of a mink's deep held memories. So the full moon brings out those wild, vicious memories that need to be controlled by the mix. Similar to a Zoan awakening, if you're not careful, the will of the animal of the double fruit will overpower your own. So if the user is unprepared, they could actually be consumed by the memory of the animal held within the double fruit. So yeah, imagination and memories are key components of devil fruits. And so I wonder if Pudding's ability to tangibilize and manipulate memories would have been useful to Vegapunk back then as well. And so now that Oda has introduced the equivalent of the Pensieve in One Piece and that Bonnie is about to see her father's memories for the first time, one of the things that I'm looking forward to is finding out the story behind why Kuma needed to pretend to be a tyrant for the public eye. Because even Jinbei says that what he knows about Kuma kind of paints a dark picture of him as being this tyrannical ruler of Sorbet Kingdom. But then Bonnie says that that's just not true. So we're going to be learning why it was that Kuma needed to pretend to be evil. I really liked the shading of the armament hockey coating on Awakened Kaku. And he's charging in at Zoro with the upgraded version of the Begone otherwise known as Nose Gun. It's a really cool design that Oda gave Kaku, to the point where I'm not one to collect figures or anything, but if they actually came out with a figure of Awakened Kaku with black armament coating, I would buy it. There's also a really good pun in the official translation when it comes to Kaku's attack. The attack is called uh, Nose Pistol Kilimanjaro, which is a pun on gyro, but it's also a pun on Kilimanjaro which is a dormant volcano in Africa. It's the highest peak in Africa. There's a bunch of safaris there. You can go out and see a bunch of animals, including giraffes. Now you've probably already seen this reference floating around online about how the whole thing with Stussy drinking Kaku's blood to put him to sleep was actually sort of foreshadowed by Oda back in the tea party in Holkic Island. Cause there's a scene where Smoothie ends up milking a giraffe by squeezing its neck. And then Stussy ends up drinking the giraffe juice and she actually really enjoys it. Now the fact that Stussy is actually revealed to be a clone helps us connect a lot of dots. But cloning itself is not a new phenomenon in One Piece. For example, we know that the first line of Pacifistas were all clones of the original Kuma. We know that Germa, the Vinsmokes, have been growing an army of clones for themselves. Now Yonji says that the clones that they have actually have an accelerated growth rate because they grow four times as fast as a normal human so it takes them five years to become 20 year olds which I don't think is the case with Stussy because given Dufeld's comment to her during the tea party she appears to be either aging normally or a lot slower than normal. Now if we look at the chronology of what Yonji says the story goes like this. Vegapunk, along with Mads, end up discovering the lineage factor, or DNA, right? The, the blueprints of life, bloodline elements. And then after they discover that, they start experimenting to see if they can create clones, and eventually they do. The government then finds out that Mads is able to clone people, and they arrest Vegapunk. And so the government absorbs Mads. So the government told Vegapunk, hey, if you want to continue to create clones, you have to make them for us. So Vegapunk starts working on creating the pacifistas and then later the seraphims. It would also fit that Caesar and Queen also got arrested by the government. And then Caesar eventually agreed to work for the government in Punk Hazard. And then maybe later at one point, Kaido showed up and freed Queen. Because Judge was really the only one who successfully escaped from the government back then. And he continued his research on cloning in Germa. Now, because this new revelation has brought the concept of cloning to the forefront, the community has sort of exploded with theories and speculation about other clones being in the story. Like, who's a clone of who? Are there other hidden or secret clones that we don't know about yet? I've seen people speculate that maybe Kuina and Tashigi are clones of each other. You know, some people speculate that maybe Zoro is a clone of Ryuma. 
Or perhaps he could be a clone of Ushimaru. Some people think that Bonnie is actually a clone of Big Mom, and that explains her pink hair and appetite. Or that she could also turn out to be the clone of Connie from Sorbet Kingdom because she looks identical to her when she gets old. So there's tons of speculation like that floating around online right now. And though I know that it could be very fun to speculate about cloning in the story, as a fan, I do think that this is something that Oda should be very mindful and specific about in terms of how he uses it in the story. I think you could only pull the clone card so many times before it starts cheapening stuff. So I think it has to be specific, it has to be mindful, and if somebody is going to turn out to be a clone of, of somebody else, it has to serve a purpose narratively. Because otherwise it just turns into this mess of like, Everybody's a clone of everyone. So I'm just going to give you my idea of what I think would be a good example of a mindful and specific execution of, of cloning, uh, you know, if there are more clones in the story. So at the end of the chapter, we find out that Stussy is the first successful clone created by Mads, which kind of implies that there might have been some unsuccessful clones before her. And then we also know, according to Vegapunk's journal entry, at the beginning that the reason for why he wanted to create this clone in the first place was to bring about world peace. So with that in mind, I think Weevil is actually an unsuccessful clone. I think he's actually a failed clone of the original Whitebeard. Now why do I say this? Okay, reason number one, the connection to the Rocks Pirates. We know from what Marco said that Miss Bocking was part of the same crew as Whitebeard 40 years or so. So if there was an interest in creating one clone from one of the Rock's pirate members, then it might have been possible that there was interest in creating clones from other members of the Rock's pirates as well, including Whitebeard, right? Because the Rock's pirates were like famous, like Garp even says, before Roger, it was their time, it was their age the Age of Rocks. So Vegapunk says that the reason why they created this clone of Miss Buckingham or Miss Bocking was because they wanted, or Vegapunk wants to create world peace. So maybe he thought if I clone uh, members of the Rocks Pirates and get them to be enforcers, right, then we can maintain some, some order. We can establish and maintain peace that way because these characters that are members of Rocks are very strong. So there might have been an attempt to clone Whitebeard that was unsuccessful. And that unsuccessful attempt was Weevil. And the main reason for why Weevil was considered a failure is because of his intellect, right? So his intellect does not match Whitebeard's intellect. Now, after it turned out that Weevil ended up being this unsuccessful clone, I think one of two things might have happened. Number one is that maybe somebody tried to get rid of him. Or the other thing that could have happened is that maybe there was something wrong with baby Weevil's body and that the baby wasn't going to survive. So maybe there was something wrong with Baby Weevil's internal organs. Or option A is that somebody saw him and said, this kid is gonna grow up to be a huge threat, so we have to get rid of him because he doesn't have Whitebeard's intellect, you know? So he could be too unpredictable. Either way, the point here is that Baby Weevil's life was in danger. He was on the verge of death. Now this is where Hogback comes in, and this is why I was talking about him a little bit earlier. Because in Thriller Bark, Chopper says that Hogback's surgeries have saved a bunch of lives, that they were considered to be miraculous. And then a little bit later in the arc, Hogback admits to that being true. He says, that's true, I saved a bunch of lives because I'm a genius, I'm a prodigy, you know? And people from all over the world would come to me so that I would save their loved ones with my surgeries. And of course, he just did it for fame and money. He didn't really care about people but he saved a bunch of people. And again, the stitching pattern that we see on Weevil matches the stitching pattern on Hogback's creations. But the most important piece of information that a lot of people forget about Weevil actually comes from Kizaru himself. There's a scene in chapter 802 where he's clipping his nails and we see some bananas at his desk. You know, just to hammer the point that his alias means yellow monkey. And he's being informed that Weevil has single-handedly taken out 16 of Whitebeard's former captains. And the total amount of casualties adds up to 600 people. He took out the AO pirates and then the anime sort of expands on that. And then the One Piece wiki also names the captains that appear on the newspaper as well. And out of those, the one that really stands out to me is Whitey Bay. But according to the wiki, Weevil has also defeated Elmi, Ramba, Bazaar, 
the DeCalvan brothers, and Palms. Now, every time we see Weevil, we see that the background is destroyed and on fire. So if he has a double fruit, which I'm pretty sure that he does, it's very, very likely that he has a very powerful Paramecia, just like Whitebeard. But in Weevil's case, I think that his double fruit gives him the power to generate explosions, kind of like Bakugo from My Hero Academia. Because the damage that we see around him is exactly what you would expect in the aftermath of an explosion. Also, the shields that we see the Marines holding to protect themselves from Weevil are actually copies of a type of shield that is used in Star Wars to protect from blasts. And then the most important piece of evidence to support this is that a Marine tells Kizaru that when Weevil meets a former Whitebeard captain, the same thing always happens, which is that they get into an argument about the legitimacy of Whitebeard's family. Weevil gets upset uh, because he's not recognized as his son, and then he just blows them up. Marco even says that he totally expects Weevil to show up at Sphinx Island to fight him, to claim Whitebeard's non-existent inheritance. And then we also know that Weevil holds a grudge against Blackbeard for killing Whitebeard, so he might actually play a role in this upcoming fight with Garp as well. But the biggest thing to remember about Weevil here is that, according to Kizaru, all right, these are Admiral Kizaru's words. Kizaru says that the way that Weevil is right now, he is just as strong as the original Whitebeard was when he was young. I'll say that again. According to Kizaru, Weevil is equal in terms of strength to Whitebeard in his youth. The community loves doing tier lists. Just loves them. And more than a few of them don't even mention Weevil. But if it's true what Borsalino says, that Weevil is just as strong as Whitebeard was when he was young, then that makes Weevil an automatic top tier. According to the information on Weevil's Vivri card, he has both armament and observation hockey, which when you think about it, that's also what we know about admirals as well, that they have both armament and observation hockey, well, and very powerful double fruits. Well, and then also at the very least, the original three admirals are confirmed to have advanced armament hockey. Now, whether or not some of the admirals and Weevil might end up having Conqueror's Hockey, might be revealed to have Conqueror's Hockey at some point, we don't know yet. Uh, but the point of the matter is, is that I do not think it's wise to underestimate Weevil, just like I don't think it's wise to underestimate an admiral. I know that bounties don't equal power. I know that very well. But just to put things into perspective, right? So Weevil's bounty, before he became a Shichibukai, was 480 million. And then it got frozen. It got frozen during the time skip because that's when he became a Shichibukai. That's when the government picked him for the position. And so that number, 480 million, is actually higher than Luffy's bounty at the beginning of the post time skip. It's higher than Law's bounty at the beginning of the post time skip. And it's also higher than Kid's bounty at the beginning of the post time skip as well. So he had 480 mil, and then he got frozen during the two year time skip. And I'm guessing that it's now unfrozen because he's no longer a Shichibukai. In fact, it's probably gone up since then. Next time we see him, totally expect him to have a, a different number attached to his name. I remember right before the reverie started, there was a section in the newspaper about him just warning the world to be careful of Weevil. It's in the manga as well, chapter 903. Another important thing to keep in mind here is that we know that Oda was heavily inspired by Dragon Ball. Like during Wano, I talked about how Hyogoro is the master Roshi of the arc. We know that Caesar Clown is voiced by the same guy who does Frieza's voice in Japanese. And Caesar just keeps coming back. I mean, he's been in three arcs already. You know, he's been in Punk Hazard, he's been in Zo, he's been in Hulkic Island. And look, look at where he's being featured now, right? In the cover story. And... He turned out to be way more important, I think, than, than most of us initially thought. And then, of course, we also know that Weevil's character in the anime is voiced by the same person who voiced Boo in Japanese. And then we also find that he has that dynamic with Miss Bakken's, or Miss Bakken, that is very similar to the dynamic that Boo had with Bobby D, where it's sort of like this parent-child dynamic where the child is incredibly strong, but lacks intellect, and they are very emotional. And because of that, they end up being manipulated by a smaller adult who's just kind of like taking advantage of them or sort of using them because of their strength. And here's the last reason for why I don't think people should sleep on Weevil. It's actually a translation from Sandman uh, from Twitter. And he translates uh, a talk that Oda had with his editor at the time I think it was either 2017 or in 2018. So back then, Oda said this. He said, 
A super cool character will appear soon. And then the editor said, whoa, really? The audience will be glad about it. And then Oda sent the design of Weevil to the editor, Sugita. And then Sugita thought, what? Does he seriously believe that this character is cool? So at first, the editor really didn't know what to say about Weevil because he saw his design and he didn't think he was cool at all. And so because of that, afterwards, Oda explained to Sugita what Weevil will do in the future of the story. And so after Oda explained that, the editor was like, oh, okay, I, I see it now. He was convinced about why Oda was saying that Weevil was cool because Oda revealed what he would do in the story. And that kind of reminds me of another statement that I read, translated by Sandman as well, where Oda said that out of the supernova that we meet in Sabodi Archipelago, that from the beginning, Oda really only had plans for Kid. That he knew that Kid was going to be important, and he knew what he wanted Kid to do in the future. But the rest just kind of like, they, he just created them sort of like organically. Right? And especially Law. He never thought that Law would be as popular as he turned out to be. So he was kind of forced, or not forced, but like he saw the fandom's response to Law and so he just developed him even more. But that really from the conception of the supernova, he really only had plans for Kit. Big plans for Kit. And now we see that, you know, Kit is headed to Elbaf. So yeah, just thought that I'd use this opportunity to say that uh, Weeble is very strong and he will be very important later on. That's it for me, guys. Thank you so much for watching and thank you for everything you do in terms of supporting the channel, whether it be subscribing, liking the videos, or commenting. I appreciate everything. Uh, hope you have a really good week. Take care and we'll catch you guys later. Bye.